You're listening to the Dead Presidents Podcast. What was that? It sounded like a bomb. And that could only mean one thing. War. Presidential war. Welcome to the Dead Presidents Podcast. I am James J. Hamilton. And I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. We're here with another thrilling edition of Presidential War. The nation's favorite presidential discussion educational card game. Our cards are dealt and we are ready to prompt an intellectually stimulating presidential That's discussion. That's right. By this point, you know the rules. If you're coming in new... Start at the beginning. Why not? For the first hand, I've drawn William McKinley. And I've drawn Millard Fillmore. And they're going head-to-head in the category of least scandals. Hmm. Well, I mean, they both had some newspaper opposition of their own. You got, uh... I mean, that's not necessarily scandalous. With McKinley and the Spanish-American War, you got the Hearst Papers. Uh, they are printing stories of scandal. Uh, to incite U.S. fervor for war. And in Millard Fillmore's case, the Compromise of 1850 is causing a whole heap of problems. A steaming pile of problems going on and newspapers waging war both ways in terms of outright scandal not too much that pops to mind immediately for me yeah not necessarily a lot of things that are directly over the plate a scandal other than just some people questioning some of their policies. I don't know, maybe for Fillmore, some of the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act yeah, exactly. was pretty All scandalous that. in the North. Yeah. Fugitive Slave Act, part of the Compromise of 1850. And just, a, uh, but even like the outright admission of California into the Union as a free state miffed some Southerners. And they had, you know, so it's like on both sides, like, you know, you got some pretty, pretty outright fervor, one way or a tother. Yeah, I mean. But yeah, obviously the Fugitive Slave Act bullshit is. Yeah, I mean there were some incredibly controversial and. Yeah, there totally were some on the wrong side of history. Some prosecutions under that that came off, uh, you know, real bad. Yeah. For the administration and the government prosecuting people for, like, not helping collect fugitive slaves or allegedly helping them escape. Yeah. When they kind of prosecuted some of the wrong people and right. charged some people with treason. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty big it deal. Ended up creating a lot more abolitionists than there were before. Because a lot of people in the North, um, you know, they don't necessarily have slavery or like it, but it's not a part of their lives. They don't care. Right. But then once the Fugitive Slave Act is intruding, it's like making them take sides. Right. Yeah. Fillmore is behind some of that. That's true. As for McKinley, um, there were those that didn't think we should get involved in the Spanish-American War. 
So there was there was some outcry to that. Uh, and some of that I find disagreeable. Yeah, we'll learn more about that in episode 25. So there's, yeah, I think, there's some um, pretty despicable shit going down on both sides here. That's not, it, you know, I guess it's not like an outright scandal, but I guess, you know, it is pretty, I guess, scandalous in terms of just like, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not like. It's of like just humanity in general. Yeah, none of these guys, they weren't like having extramarital affairs or like accepting bribes or the kind of things that are mm-hmm. directly scandals. Oh, well, I mean. Miller no, Fillmore had we'll his see. wife stand through Franklin Pierce's inauguration in that bitter cold, and that's when she contracted the illness that killed her. Yeah. That's scandalous. Let's get yeah, the hand he, to, he uh, married an older woman who was very rich afterwards. Let's, let's got his McKinley. wife out of the way. Yeah, I, I slightly let McKinley win the sand. Yeah. We'll move on to another hand. I'm going to draw Ulysses Grant. And I've got Zachary Taylor. Their category, pre-presidential accomplishments. Wow. Oh. Wow, this is a good one. Two classic soldiers. I mean, yeah, I fact, think the weight of the accomplishment, though, it has to go to Grant. Like oh, both yeah. Both of these guys' career. Well, I mean, I guess Grant wasn't necessarily a career soldier. He had a lot of, like, kind of well, failed business attempts. and He was a career soldier for a while. Things, then yeah. he resigned from the Army because he was caught drinking. Yeah. And then he, he got back spotty, in during the war. Spotty services. But I, I would say that, you know, yeah, Grant's pre-presidential accomplishments were immense. Yeah. I mean, he won a much bigger war yeah. Did a lot more like intense battling and campaigning, but yeah, not gonna knock Zach Taylor as a soldier. Yeah, but you got to give it to Grant here. Yeah, we'll have you know you'll hear in episode twelve coming up soon. Zachary Taylor, very successful general in the Mexican American War, won a fought a few pretty big battles. Um, some of the biggest. Probably the biggest battles that the U.S. had fought since the Absolutely. Revolutionary yeah. War. Absolutely, yeah, and I mean, he was outnumbered. Probably in all cases. Yeah. He was outnumbered, if not outgunned. Yeah, that's a distinct possibility. Um, yeah, these are probably two of the better cards to have in the pre-presidential accomplishments category. Two successful generals that had real no political experience became president just on the weight of their military success. That's right. But Grant... It was a trendy thing to do at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Grant, yeah, the whole Vicksburg campaign and then the Overland campaign that won the war. Yeah. Huge. And he stood out when a bunch of other generals were failing. Yeah. Even Shiloh. Yeah. They won one great. Taylor, like the Mexican American War is pretty successful across the board. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a pr- pretty sweeping victory. But yeah, the Union Army had a lot of lackluster generalship before. That's right. Ulysses yeah, Grant, Grant was standout among Union generals, whereas, you know, Taylor and Scott were more or less even keel. Yeah. In terms of, you know, leading the army. So yeah, this is going to Grant. Yep. Good matchup. Indeed. Next hand, I've got John Adams. And I've got his successor, Thomas Jefferson. Their category, who would you pick first in flag football? I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Thomas Jefferson has come up in this before. He lost, I believe. But I can't, I can't remember the circumstances. Um, this would actually be... A pretty good one. Yeah, this is a... John Adams is like a stocky scrapper. Mm-hmm. Whereas Jefferson would be like undoubtedly the quicker, more nimble yeah. of the two. He's definitely a lot taller. Uh-huh. He could, you know, jump up to catch the pass right over 
John Adams would have a hard time covering Thomas Jefferson in flag football. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if it was tackle, I don't know if Jefferson or Adams could probably bowl him over. It's possible, yeah. I, I think the edge goes to Thomas Jefferson, but I'm not going to say that John Adams wouldn't be shabby at it. Yeah. Depending on how he was feeling. Yeah, Jefferson, <laughs> I think he got a lot of exercise. He walked and rode horses a lot and went hunting and stuff. He's probably fairly, fairly in good shape. Oh, I think I just recalled. Um, I think it was William Henry Harrison that came up. And it was like a tie situation, maybe? And it was like, oh, who would you go with? You'd go with Mr. Jefferson's hammer. Yeah. I think that was that was what I was thinking of. Mm. Yeah. But uh, this time, I think Thomas Jefferson comes ahead. Yep. Now Next I've got up. Calvin Coolidge. Going against Barack Obama in the category... Effect on the office of the presidency. Well, I'm outright going to state that I think that's an unfair disadvantage for Obama because it's too soon to state his yeah. effect on the office of the presidency. Yeah, it's almost too soon to talk about Obama in almost any of these categories from a real historical perspective. Yeah. I think, I think it might have been Shelby Foote said like you need like 20 years to pass before you can really look at something that's fair with the historical eye that's fair but yeah um well obama one one effect he had on the office of the presidency opened it up to non-whites for the first time well yeah that's pretty big that yeah um yeah in terms of more his administration, yeah, probably too early to say. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, you can't say much outside of, like... I mean, you got his former vice president as become the 46th president, yeah. so probably doing a lot of similar things, probably a lot of similar people involved in the administration... So yeah, people, I mean, people, you know, liked Obama enough to have Biden go into the presidency largely on his association with Obama. Sure. And then Coolidge. I mean, we mentioned yeah, before. Yeah, we have talked about Coolidge in this category before. How, um, He's you know, a classic Jeffersonian Republican and yeah. somebody that, you know, Reagan, if not outright emulated, at least admired yeah he's like you know the classic like laissez-faire small government kind of guy right. the uh, kind of yeah but he's kind of uh almost a symbol of a bygone time we just don't see that mm -hmm. kind of thing anymore you know so well, that's the kind of thing republicans still like talk about sure as their ideal if not uh actually doing it as much Right. The way the government has changed since then makes it kind of hard. Yeah. And then based on the times that followed Coolidge, it was initially going to be hard to hearken back to something like that when you're dealing with depression and war. And, well, you know, the Republicans were out for quite a hunk of years. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't really till. What, Eisenhower? Eisenhower, and he, he was courted by both that. sides. Uh, he wasn't, like, committed to anybody in particular and ended yeah. up siding with the Republicans. Um, but then, you know... I don't know. Well, you know, with you know Reagan coming in with this so-called Reagan revolution was like a kind of get Calvin Coolidgeism back in, in style. That's true. So people, you know, still haven't forgotten Reagan himself, style. like, uh, was pretty laissez-faire as a chief executive yeah I, well that's just an aside but yeah this is a really tough one to be completely honest I don't know I almost if I'm not thinking about administration I almost want to say Obama just because it finally after so long opened the door 
to people of color finally being accepted as pro- in prominent places. Yeah. And we hadn't seen anything like that, you know, and that's kind of like saying something. Yeah. Uh, it's not saying yeah, that's... anything particularly <laughs> good for the white man, but that's the typical case. Well, I mean, it's good. <laughs> You're going to... The, it's the good, it's overriding good. lesson that streams through the Dead President's podcast is like... Yeah, the white man is fucked up quite a bit. Well, I think Barack Obama shows that now the white man is willing to vote for a black man. In, Which is a good in, thing. In, in large part. That's kind, of, that's kind of why I want, I think maybe I want to give this to hand to yeah. Obama. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Next up, I have got Woodrow Wilson. And he's going up against... Obama's predecessor, George W. Bush. Their category, military accomplishments. Well, these are two wartime presidents. Yep. Let's see. Well, as far as personal involvement in the military, yeah, was, nothing. George W. Bush was what in the Air National Guard, right? And, and then nothing for Wilson was not. Um, necessarily hailed for his service there. Now, I imagine as a boy he probably, you know, played that he was a Confederate soldier or something. Bush? No, Wilson. Oh, Wilson, yeah. <laughs> that would be the extent of his, like, you know, just, like, playing, like, when he was a little kid, like, yeah. playing soldier, and he would definitely have chosen the Confederate side. I don't know. This is a, another total aside, but one thing about Wilson is like, you know, we've talked about like he was a historian, you know, but we didn't we didn't actually like uh address the fact that he was like a bad historian. He was not a good historian. Yeah. But that's another story for another time. Uh it, it and Wilson the only way you could look at this one is, you know, we got World War One going on, the Great War. Yeah. The war to end all wars. Um, he kept us out of it in the first term. Mm-hmm. And then had to get into it. And... Yeah, we got into it. At a good time. Late, yeah. I mean, it, it you know... I mean... Our side won it pretty quickly once we got in yeah, there. Yeah, it made us look pretty good. Whereas for George W. Bush, that war did not make us look good at all. Well. And the fact that, you know, not totally over. Yeah. Well, yeah, That's you know, he had, you know, probably you could say a few different wars. The war on yeah. terror generally, and then the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan kind of started off, seemingly started off strong, at least, like, going into Afghanistan real quick, and then mission accomplished in Iraq, and then, yeah. and then those that wars That was a blunder, and, like, uh, um, I mean, I don't know, everybody was gung-ho at, right after September 11th, mm-hmm. you know, but then when we started, to, let's go, hey, let's go here, what about, look into this. You know, uh, then people yeah. were kind of like, all right, now what's going on here? Yeah, this is another instance of where it may be too soon to judge for history. Um, Possibly. Some of those wars that he started are kind of Well, I mean, the war on terror, like, hasn't been won because every fall, haunted houses. Yep. All over the place. Mm-hmm. Terror reigns. Yeah. But Al Qaeda not really uh, too big anymore. Yeah, and you know the whole, you know that whole kind of. And I've heard they had some of the best haunted houses. Hell yeah, it's real scary over there. Um, yeah, I guess you know obviously you know Bin Laden killed under the Obama administration, but that whole like thing was picked, you know, began by Bush. Uh, when when did uh, Hussein get? That was Bush. 
Yeah. 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 He was. Yeah. He was captured in 2003 or four. Yeah, three or four. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I think Bush is too wishy-washy. I think I'd go with Wilson because. Yeah, Bush, that was you know it's, like that's more of a proven like okay, the U.S. means bidding it. Yeah. Bush's and whereas things. Bush is kind of like the period of like, what the fuck's going on here? You know, is this good? Is this bad? Yeah, it's it's like, what the mixed. fuck are we doing? I you mean, know? They, he had the surge. And yeah, deeply mixed kind of uh, opinions on it, to say the least. Yeah, and still maybe too soon to judge. But Wilson kind of got us a clean victory in a big war, so we'll let him win the category. Yeah. Next up, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Going up against Lyndon Baines Johnson. Their category, who would you most like to meet? Mm, in this case, it's another one for me where it's like one might be a lot more fun, but I'm going to go Eisenhower. Like, Johnson might be fun, but at the same time, he could be such an intimidating asshole that it might be uncomfortable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm... Like five ten and weigh like a hundred and forty five pounds, and Johnson would just tower over me and probably make me feel like a little bitch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably... Eisenhower it would be a lot more of like a nice, respectable like conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'll have bet, a good talk. But LBJ would be fun to hang out with, like if you were like one of his close friends. Yeah, but just meeting him. There's probably, yeah, a chance you'd walk away being like, wow, what a dick. Yeah, what a jerk. That guy just, like, whipped his dick out. Yeah. He's known to do that. You know, Eisenhower, I mean, I don't know. I think it would just be a cool, like, sit-down conversation. Yeah, he's pretty cool. You right. Play, play a round of golf with him. While he'd certainly regale you with the famous hole-in-one story. Yeah. Yeah, this one's going to... This one's going to Ike. Yeah, he'd have some good war stories. Absolutely. Tell the story of playing football against Jim Thorpe. Yeah, that'd be a good one to hear. Uh, as well as any number of WW2 stories. Yeah. That he would be... That he's just bound to have. Mm-hmm. Next up, I've got Ronald Reagan. And he's going head-to-head -head against William Henry Harrison. The category... First Lady Looks. Well, you're looking at a perspective of two completely different times. You got Anna Sims Harrison mm -hmm. on the one hand, and you got Nancy Davis Reagan. She was an actress. Yeah, she was definitely. She was a dish in her day. Yeah, she was quite a looker in her younger days. Absolutely. It's I mean, I'm, of... a, I'm automatically leaning towards her just because. She's the much more, like, I just, you know, I know what she looks like. But but more than, like, you know, the picture that immediately pops to mind of her is, like, the first lady. Like, I, I you know, seen her from the actress days and stuff. Like, yeah. I know, yeah, you know, but, you she know, was a dish. Reagan, one of the older presidents, so Nancy on the older side once she becomes yeah, first lady. Yeah, right. But I'm trying to... Uh, Look up Anna Harrison to refresh my mm, recollection. There's not too many. I think she just has like the looks. one or two portraits, maybe. Yeah, that's a disadvantage of. Yeah, she's kind of. I think she's kind of standard ladies. for her time. I don't know if I could find anything. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, that's the that's the one I've seen. Yeah, Looks like she's wearing like a, you know, kind of a. Fruit bowl on a hit. Yeah. Yeah, our listeners can... Obviously, you should Google the First Lady so you can objectify them along with us. You're right. You could decide for yourselves, but I think we're going to go with Nancy Reagan. Yeah, I'd agree. One of the benefits of being a handsome Hollywood actor, you get to marry Hollywood actresses. And that's right. Reagan took advantage of that. Indeed. Next up, we got Franklin Delano Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Their category, Relationship with the Media. 
Well, I mean, this one seems pretty one-sided for Roosevelt. You got the fireside chats going on. The guy's in there for 12 years. Yeah, he was pretty masterful in his use of the media. Yeah, he's pretty popular. Yeah, I think I, one of the... He knows how to deal with them, too. Yeah. You know? I Taft. think it, in the biography I read of him, if I recall, like, he'd have the, you know, reporters and would all, you know, come to him for comments and he'd decide what he wants to tell them and not and they'd kind yeah. of just, like, accept it and if they didn't toe the line, then they wouldn't get access and then... Well, and he's more know, the kind of guy that would, like, know, like, each like press person's name and stuff and he'd be yeah. like all right harry if you're going to fuck with me then mm. i'll do the same damn thing to you yeah and he really took advantage of the new media of radio oh yeah he get he's got the legs for radio yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, Taft, I don't know, there's not too, I mean, it's like the papers, and it's, I don't know, you had Teddy Roosevelt doing his shtick towards the end, and that's like lambasting Taft the whole time. Yeah, Taft, you know, ultimately he had, wasn't like, able to even hold his own party together on his right. side for his re-election. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure he had his own press that supported him, but it wasn't as loud as the Roosevelt press, or probably even the, you know... Wilson press. No. I don't know. This has, this just seems like an easy Vic for FDR. Yeah. Definitely. It's one of the top cards in that category. I agree. Next up, I've got George Washington. And I've got Franklin Pierce. Please be looks. Yeah. Who would win in a fight? Ooh. Hmm. Damn, even then, I don't know. Pierce is younger. I mean, well, it depends on when you're looking at this, too. Yeah, I mean, I think if you'd... You if know, it's, well, I like, don't know. Washington's still going to kick if, his ass, I think. Yeah, I think if they were going at it while they're, like, the same age, Washington would definitely, definitely. win. But even... At the age there, if I'm thinking of, like, the in age they become, you know... If I'm thinking at the age they become president, and Pierce is, like, 49, then... Well, I don't know. He'd also be like, well, maybe he, his his grief would like put him into a blind, furious rage, you know, too. So if you're looking at like inauguration day fight, maybe Pierce. But any other time, I think Washington. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Washington. Let me look at his. Uh, he's a. Uh, Clocking in at six foot two, 175 pounds in his prime, erect in bearing, muscular, broad shouldered, had large hands and feet, size 13 shoes. Right, yeah, I think, I mean, well, Washington's the definitely the US more physical, presidents. imposing. Pierce is another one kind of built like me, not particularly tall and thin. Yeah, Pierce, you know, he served in the Mexican-American War. He was a general. Yeah. He was what? He's five foot ten. Suffered often from respiratory ailments. As president had a persistent cough due to chronic bronchitis. Heavy drinking over many years also undermined his health. Of course, yeah. number one on the top five drunkest president. Yeah, I mean, he's gonna get liquored up and come at you, but I don't think he's holding it against Washington. Washington. Yeah, and long experienced. Yeah, this is a this is a Washington hand. fighter. He's gonna put a little bit of a beat down on Franklin Pierce, probably. Oh yeah. Next up, I've got John Tyler. He's going against Abraham Lincoln. The category: foreign policy. Well, that's actually interesting. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln, obviously, his administration dominated by domestic policy. Yeah. Not really a lot of foreign policy going on. Well, 
Didn't Seward acquired Alaska from Russia? And that was time? when Johnson was president. Oh, that's Johnson. Okay. Yeah, that was well, eight, I guess 1867. The main foreign policy of the Lincoln years was to prevent Britain and other countries from recognizing the South as, as a, a nation, sovereign nation yeah. and potentially aiding them in the war. And they succeeded in, in that. Yeah, whereas, like, we've talked about John Tyler a little bit, and he had some pretty huge foreign policy achievements. Yeah, he did. I mean, you guys just listened to episode 10. Well, and I believe he's come up in in war. Yeah. But you could, because I remember talking about Webster-Ashburton Treaty mm -hmm. and the Treaty of Wangia. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii, you know, you got a lot going on, to be yeah. honest, with John Tyler, and it's actually pretty successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'd probably lean towards Tyler on the same. Yeah, I think he had more I think this is on. an upset for John Tyler, yeah. taking it from Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. But hey, we're fair and objective. Yeah. Hey, there were some, you know, potential categories where Pierce would have beaten Washington. Yeah. Lincoln can fall to John Tyler. Anything can happen in presidential war. That's right. Let's see. I've got James Buchanan. And I've got James Monroe. Let's see if there's any category where Buchanan can win. If it's something with first ladies, I am just going to hurl the machine out of the window. And we're going to stop. Let's see what we got. It's domestic policy. Lincoln just missing it. Yeah. Well... Buchanan's got to have just about the worst of his yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his domestic policy is not to have a policy, to be too weak and spineless to uh, have one. Yeah. Basically. He let... So no matter what we of... can say against James Monroe here, he still wins. J James Buchanan is not a good domestic policy card. He's probably the worst domestic policy card. Yeah, he let half of the domestics leave. Yeah, exactly. Just threw up his hands in despair and was like, oh, there's nothing I can do. You know, so yeah. there's no way he wins I mean, this hand. Obviously, you know? he got dealt a pretty tough hand, but, yeah, you know, couldn't have... Anybody could have done it. Couldn't have done... Better. Yeah. Anybody. If Pierce had gotten reelected, he would have done it better. If Fillmore had somehow gotten elected after, he would have done it better. Uh, mm -hmm. You know. Too bad Zachary Taylor dropped dead. Yeah, there's just no argument here. This is a hand for James Monroe. Yeah, he had the Missouri Compromise. Eh, Panic of eighteen nineteen. You know, Not yeah, great, I mean, but that's what I mean. Like, despite like the stuff that was going on there, yeah, uh, there's just. Vetoed some internal improvements. First Seminole War. Yeah. Kind of. Well, yeah, I mean, that's there's kind stuff of a, going on. That's like, a foreign policy that becomes domestic policy through yeah. the acquisition. Of it's Florida. just the sad luck of yeah. the draw that it came, he came up against somebody yeah. that no argument needs to be made. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got a guy who's president during the era of good feelings yeah. versus James Buchanan. <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, who was president in the era of ouch. Yeah. Not such a flattering nickname for his era. Uh -uh. We'll move on to the next hand where I have drawn Rutherford B. Hayes. And I have drawn James Madison. The category post presidential accomplishments. Okay, so I. Buchanan has come up a lot with, like, First Lady-related stuff, but Madison, with post-presidential accomplishments, has been almost every game of war. Out of, this is now our sixth game, it's been three, if not four times he's in this game. It's absolutely unbelievable. We are beating ourselves to, to death. We're flogging yeah. a dead horse while beating ourselves to death with James Madison's post-presidential uh, uh, post -presidential accomplishments. University of Virginia... Oh, the classic old sage. Well respected. Yep. My God. Virginia Constitutional Convention. Yeah. Spoke out against nullification. Yep. You know, he had a long and, you know, pretty decent post-presidency. 
did. Let's take a gander at the complete book of U.S. presidents and see what Rutherford B. Hayes was up to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I think he just kind of hung out, didn't he? Well, let's see. He died in 1893, so yeah. he was only around for about 12 years. He declined a second term, or declined to seek a second term. Yeah. Retired. Loyally supported future Republican candidates. Encouraged oh. temperance. Mm-hmm. I'm sure at the urging of his wife. Yeah. Old he, Lemonade Lucy. He was the director of the George Peabody Educational Fund and the John F. Slater Fund, which promoted black education. Awarded That's good. scholarships, including two future black activists, W.E.D. W.E.B. Du Bois. That's awesome. Served as a trustee of Ohio State University. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, so, I mean, you got some, you got some uh, kindling on both sides. Yeah. Some similar stuff. I think just, you know, I'm so used to hearing about Madison stuff that hearing about uh, Rutherford Hayes's, uh, you know, civil rights stuff, like, strikes me as, like, more cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Madison seemed to be, I mean, he was around longer and yeah. probably involved in more high-profile things. Right. I really like, um... That during the nullification crisis, he spoke out and called secession and nullification twin heresies. Yeah. When even, like, I don't know specifically about Jefferson, but I think Jefferson was probably more, you know, drifting towards the eventual nullification side of things more than Madison was. So I think it's more of a credit to him that he remained staunchly unionist. Yeah. When Jefferson was yeah, becoming I mean, in, more in states like rightist. Import, I mean, you know, I think like we said before, like some of the lasting effects of the things the founders did obviously have a greater weight. I mean, I think, yeah, I think Madison wins, but I think Hayes is like actually really, really close in this because I, I dig the civil rights work early yeah. on. I give Garfield a lot of credit for that. I didn't really if I had read I had forgotten that about Hayes. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. But I think overall probably going to lean Madison. Yeah, me too. Give that one to Madison. And moving on, I've drawn... Andrew Jackson. And I've drawn Chester Arthur. Their category, the economy. Okay. Well, the Jackson economy, kind of complex. It was pretty it booming is. during the eight years of his presidency and then crashed two or three weeks after he left office. Yeah. Arguably, uh, aided in that crash by some of his policies, but also arguably an inevitable, you know, result of a boom and bust, you know, yeah. kind of bubble economy. Yeah. Paid off the national debt. Huge, you know. Pretty big deal. Western land. Never happened expansion again. at the time. Never happened again. Uh, Arthur, I mean, we're getting into the Gilded Age, man. The Gilded Age of the United States. Yeah, let's... You got the Industrial Revolution moving mm. and grooving and jumping and jiving. Things aren't looking too shabby economically there. I mean, there's, you know, you got your... I think just normal kind of fluctuations where you would have kind of at any given point. I don't think there's anything radical there. 
Yeah, Arthur, 1883, introduced a reduced tariff. And let's see, economic-wise, he vetoed the Rivers and Harbors Act, just as James K. Polk and Jackson and yeah. Monroe and Madison vetoing similar bills. Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of a tough one. I mean, I think if you factor out knowing what's going to happen in two weeks, yeah, Jackson wins. Mm -hmm. So I guess the argument's there. But obviously, in retrospect, we know that that's not going to end well. But I guess at the time, like people were like, eh, okay. I mean, I think the bank thing scared a lot of people because there was a lot of uncertainty, but it, I don't know. It's, it's, to me, I would think it would be like super like scary and you'd it'd be pretty precariously balanced on like a big what if in terms of just outright killing the Bank of the United States. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say exactly what to think of Jackson and his, you know, because it wasn't till you know, Polk established the independent treasury that they kind of got a more solid alternative to the bank in there. Yeah, Van Buren's attempt at the independent treasury was just immediately done away with when you get to Harrison Tyler. Mm -hmm. Not Harrison Tyler, the person, but like William Henry Harrison slash John Tyler. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of leaning towards Ar Arthur seeming to be the safer bet. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was... I don't think it's until you get into, I think, during... When's the next real bad one? It's not till Cleveland's second term. So there's, like, a, a couple nice, like, the housing years of the yeah. United States, really, economically. Yeah, I mean, Arthur was around in more, like, stable economic times. Yeah, I picture, like, out, well, outside of the assassination, I picture, like, Garfield... Arthur, uh, Cleveland, Harrison, as like a pretty solid time. Yeah. Those are the housing days of the United States. Cleveland second term, you get some depressions going on. Mm -hmm. And then with McKinley, you get into, you know, American imperialism and shit like that. But for those four, mm -hmm. that's pretty nice. That's like the housing days yeah, and of the United States. Jackson in a more like boom and bust time where the kind of government based foundations of economic policy yeah. are in flux and Jackson's certainly part of that things hadn't really you know weren't really settled down by the time he got out of there right so it's hard to compare but I guess I'd, I'd probably give it to Arthur just, Gonna give it to Chet Arthur. Just uh, next up, I've got Teddy Roosevelt, and I've got Martin Van Buren. The category: strength of presidential appointments. Okay. Well, gonna we're consult gonna salt with the complete book of U.S. presidents, of course. Yeah. And let's see what we got here with Van Buren. If anything, oh, Secretary of the Treasury, Levi Woodbury. That's a pretty important fella. Benjamin Butler of uh, New York as Attorney General. Not the same Benjamin Butler of the Civil War. Felix Grundy in there at Attorney General. He would serve briefly before resigning to return to the Senate. 
Amos Kendall, of course, super important Jacksonian behind the scenes figure. He's in there. Some Jackson holdovers like John Forsyth and uh, let's see, you got Joel Poinsett. He was Minister to Mexico under JQA. Well, I think uh, Teddy Roosevelt had some pretty sure. good ones as well. He had Elihu Root, who was Secretary of War when he came in, and then um, moved him over to Secretary of State. He was instrumental in Latin American policy, the Roosevelt Corollary, the Monroe Doctrine. Elihu, Elihu Root awarded the 1912 Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, he was pretty involved. And... It wasn't root was maybe it later a potential um, presidential candidate. He was a pretty big deal, and then obviously replacing root in War Secretary William Howard Taft, right? President in his own right, um, and one of Teddy Roosevelt's Supreme Court appointments, Oliver Wendell Holmes, big deal, was a, a giant of the law in the court. Yeah, I think I'm leaning towards T.R. Yeah, just, you know, obviously in general, he had a much more successful presidency than Van Buren. Yeah. And a lot of that had to do with his own active personality. But he had some but, good people in there with him. Yeah, and he really knew how to, like, handle people. Absolutely. And manage them, so he certainly... uh ran his cabinet and his administration pretty successfully and had a lot of good people in it. So For sure. Right, you know. That's going to be TR. TR taking the category. The next hand, I've got George H.W. Bush. I've got Gerald Ford. They're going to be going head to head in relationship with the people. Wow. That's a pretty good one. Gerald Ford. They both course, got made fun of in, yeah. in their own ways, but they both, like, kind of took it good-spiritedly. Yeah. You know, with good humor. Ford, of course, never elected by the people, so that's probably... That's true. ...a disadvantage for him in a category like this. He, he was, was elected never... by the Dead Presidents podcast as our number one presidential athlete yeah george hw bush only number four on that list yeah if it's the people in the stands at the michigan football game they're saying it's jerry ford it's definitely gonna be ford but yeah i mean george hw bush maybe you know as a president not necessarily a huge man of the people well i think the 92 debates are what like did him in in terms of his image and here's the thing with that he was going against bill clinton mm -hmm. who like had a really good image yeah he and definitely got bush out, came out off charismaed. bush came off as preppy mm -hmm. and a little bit smarmy maybe you know the whole that that one question in the debate where he checks his watch while the lady's asking him the question like that about mm -hmm. sealed the deal right there, because it's like, all right, he's disconnected from what the average person's going through. He's and that that was where Clinton, you know, did his famous, you know, I feel your pain. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, Bush, you know, he kind of became president on the heels of Reagan's success, was in there more of like, you know, just a competent career guy. You know, neither of these guys are a, a man of the people. It was, yeah. you know, Reagan, George W. Bush, our 45th president, are more the kind of populist side, the more charismatic side of the Republican Party, as opposed to these guys. Yeah. Yeah, both obviously beaten for re-election. I think I'm willing to call this one a draw. Yeah, I kind of, yeah. I want to call it a draw, too, because neither of them 
very successful, but, you know, also not, like... Not, like, not, necessarily unsuccessful. Either. Yeah. Neither of them are, like, big losers. No. But, yeah, they're both kind of pretty... I mean, they both lost the election they were yeah, going pretty, for in their own right. They're, I mean, so they're, like, pretty even keel, yeah, and I think as people, even. like... As people, like, I think they'd both be about the same level of, like, approachability and... Yeah. You know? Kind of similar guys in a lot of ways. Yeah. So we're going to call this a draw. We'll carry these cards on over in a high stakes next hand where I've got first term Grover Cleveland. And I've got Herbert Hoover. Their category... Best president overall. First term Cleveland. No question. Yeah. First term Cleveland. Just a powerhouse. Like, that's one of my favorite single terms of a U.S. president. Uh, he is wielding the veto like a mighty sword. He is reestablishing presidential power after a relatively lackadaisical period. Yeah. Of congressional control. First term Cleveland, one of my absolute favorite single presidential terms. Mm. Uh, Hoover. Ugh. Yeah, not not one of the more distinguished presidential terms. Like the first... Uh, was basically the worst four years of Hoover's life for those of his presidency. Yeah. Outside of that... He was a pretty cool cat. Yeah. Coolidge didn't care much for his advice. No. But. Yeah, what, what, was he Secretary of Commerce mm -hmm. under Coolidge? Yeah. Yeah, Coolidge, not a big fan, but. Yeah, Hoover, highly respected until he became president. And mm -hmm. got hit with the Depression, not necessarily his fault, but. Yeah, he makes it worse, and we've talked about how yeah. shitty the veterans bonus march ended up and what like a black spot on the presidency that was yeah this is just no questions asked big GC for the Vic yep that's what I got I'm winning four cards with that hand good draw with first term Cleveland indeed Let's see what happens next I've got Andrew Johnson and I've got Warren Gamaliel Harding. The category, Relationship with Congress. Ouch. Well, both of these guys. Uh, lesser presidents. Andy Johnson probably had among the shittiest relationships with Congress of any president. Yeah. Yeah, they really hated him. They hated yeah. him so much, they impeached him over... You know, a bullshit issue. Yeah, it's something that they just basically like pulled out of their ass and said, "Yeah, the president can't do this." And he was like, "Fuck you, yes I can." And they were like, "No, you can't." Yeah, that was and then he barely got out of it and was like, "Yes, I can." Yeah, the Tenure of Office Act that purported to require congressional approval for the president to fire cabinet members. So I'd give Johnson credit for not. Kowtowing to Congress yeah. on that issue. Yeah, he for was sure. Just right about that. But yeah. Yeah, he was really not the man for the time and was no. not well suited to the Congress. He was he, very he ill was, suited for Reconstruction. Yeah. He obviously not elected and wasn't the people's choice yeah. to go with the people's Congress there and had a lot of problems. Yeah, and despite his faults, Harding got along pretty well with Congress because he let himself be dictated yeah. to, you know, so... Yeah, and like Johnson, he kind of just went yeah. along. So actually, I think, like, this is going to go to Harding just because he, you know... Yeah. Kind of just, like, let them do their thing. Yeah, Johnson, one of the worst relationships with Congress. Yeah. Go to the next hand where I have got Benjamin Harrison. And I've drawn John Quincy Adams. The category, speeches and writings. Ooh, another really clear-cut victory here. We uh, 
have talked about Benjamin Harrison having written a couple books that nobody has ever republished and nobody yeah. presumably cares about. He wrote This Country of Ours and Views of an Ex-President. Yeah, I remember he beat James Buchanan in this category before. Yeah, even though you could get James Buchanan's yeah. book. You can't get, like, I don't know, you can't readily get Harrison's yeah, books. Yeah, well, Buchanan's book consisted of defending the presidency of James Buchanan. Right, so, so it was just a flop. Really. And Harrison's were apparently dull enough that nobody ever thought to, like, republish them yeah. for just yeah. widespread viewing, whereas JQA has diaries. Yeah, his and, life diary. You know. Any, probably any month of his diary would outweigh Benjamin Harrison's uh, right stuff. And, he, I mean, he was pretty brilliant. I mean, the dude. Yeah, he wrote, uh, oh, I'm seeing here in the complete book, U.S. Presidents, J.Q.A. wrote in 1850, he wrote The Lives of James Madison and James Monroe. That so, would probably be a pretty interesting read. Book. And he also published a book of poetry yeah, he was a poet. As you know, I mean, he'll he'll win on speeches and writings just for having written the lyrics. To for the wants of man. The wants of man. Yeah. Which uh, the Constitutionalists immortalized right. as a rap song in episode six. That's it. Well. J.Q.A., quite the literary man. Yeah. And, and he's going to be taking this hand. Lots of great speeches against the gag rule and slavery in congress yeah one of the better presidents in this category absolutely next hand i've got james k polk and i've got harry s truman the category first lady accomplishments Ooh, well we've uh talked before about sarah polk among the more important first ladies. Mm -hmm. And her accomplishments for her time are immense. Oh, yeah. Beth Truman was... was unfortunately treated, I think, at the time. Well, and Harry kind of was, too, at the beginning. Yeah, they didn't get a lot of respect at no. the gate because they weren't elected they weren't franklin roosevelt well and they weren't and they were kind of uh particularly uh, uh what's a worldly what's, yeah that's a good way of putting it they were looked at as being a little bit coarse mm -hmm. yeah not as sophisticated as the roosevelts right tough act to follow for both of them yeah uh, franklin and eleanor roosevelt ranking pretty high mm -hmm. particularly in how the people see them yeah complete yeah. book u.s president says official entertaining at the white house during the truman years was limited due to the white house being under repair yeah yeah they were First over at the blair house for a blair while house. Mrs. Truman discontinued the first lady press conferences initiated by eleanor roosevelt yeah she won the fan wasn't a fan and there's the famous uh video that you could see on youtube of she goes to chris in a ship with by breaking the champagne bottle over it and they didn't uh what do they do is it cork it they didn't cork it first so that they you could make it easier to break yeah, no, they set her up, basically, and so it's just her bashing this bottle against the side of this ship it's unsuccessfully, yeah. yeah. It says here about Bess Truman, according to her daughter's 1986 biography of her, Bess resented Truman's decision to accept the vice presidency and detested her years in the White House. Yeah. So, not a big, big fan. contrast with Sarah Polk, right. who was... The consummate political wife. Yeah. And, you know, an exemplary first lady. You'll find out a lot more about her in episode 11. That's right. But yeah, she was one of the greatest first ladies of her time and of all time, probably. Indeed. 
her husband's closest advisor, campaign manager when he was coming up, and where he was more of a, you know, austere kind of guy. She was very charming and helped, yeah. you know, in the Washington political scene to make yeah. friends. Polk, austere, severe, he held few people dear. Sarah, the polar opposite. Yeah. This hand's going to go to James K. Polk. Yep. And the next hand, I draw James A. Garfield. And I have drawn John F. Kennedy. The category, the relationship with the Constitution. Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, Kennedy's got some stuff being called into question. Where you get the Cuban Missile Crisis and Bay of Pigs. Uh, yeah, maybe, you know, executive... The executive discretion to conduct foreign policy without yeah. congressional approval a little bit. Yeah, that could be called into question there. But yeah, I, well, you know, both of these presidents were assassinated. Yeah, Didn't Kennedy had a longer times. time, but... And this is a, you know, sometimes this is a uh, tough category where... Maybe presidents don't necessarily have obvious. I instinctively want to give it to Garfield. I just think that there's less that could be drawn into question with him. Mm -hmm. I think Garfield was a was a pretty stand up guy. He was a good man. He, you know, honored and respected the Constitution in the truest sense. Yeah, I think if he would have got more of a chance to be president, he yeah. definitely would have shined in I many think he's he's the, he's the biggest one. like missed opportunity in presidential history. I think he could have been one of our greatest presidents had he had the shot. Yeah. Oh, or had he not gotten shot. Mhm. Whoops. Not for the shot. Yeah. Mhm. Some Kennedy fans might feel the same way. That's true. Let's see. JFK, I'm looking him up in the complete book of U.S. presidents. You know, he established a committee on equal employment opportunity and called for desegregation. He kind of, you know, it, none of this was accomplished till LBJ's presidency. Yeah. He kind of started maybe the ball rolling a bit on civil rights, which would be... I'd say a good relationship with the Constitution thing. In but James A. Garfield was pushing for civil rights in yeah. the 1880s. Mm -hmm. That's true. So, so I mean, know, I don't know, them, dude. Both of them uh, trying to make the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause like actually... Un Garfield unnecessarily of ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd probably give it to Garfield in this category. I think I would, too. Both of them tragically cut short their opportunities to prove themselves yeah. in so many categories as president. Next hand, I've got Jimmy Carter. And I've got Richard Nixon. Their category, looks. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Now, our listeners can recall... The looks of Jimmy Carter. And yeah, you could picture both of these Jimmy guys. And you know what they look like, but let me see. I'm gonna look up we got to go from youth, right? Well, I guess it's across the board. Yeah. You take into account what they look like as president and then what they look like as young men. I can't say. Let's see, Jimmy Carter... That I'm leaning towards either of them. Mm. But. I'm looking up young Jimmy Carter. He's got kind of a pointy nose. Well, Carter, like, was pretty open and 
you know, was he took part in like the jokes about his teeth. Mm. Mm, looking up young Richard Nixon, I think R- Nixon's definitely more handsome than Carter as a young man. Nixon's kind of the darker, brooding sort of guy, you know? Yeah. Maybe a little bit more poetic or uh, in some way. I'd probably go with Nixon here. Yeah, there's something in his eyes that says, what's he hiding? Mm-hmm. We're going to give it to Nixon. Nixon is the better looker in this category. We are down to the last card. Oh, yeah, we are. And I've got Bill Clinton. And he's going up against second term Grover Cleveland. Their category, biggest partier. Biggest partier. (laughs) I think this is going to go to Slick Willie. Well, yeah. He certainly didn't let being president stop him. Yeah, I mean, definitely. This is, I guess, this is this is one of the one ones where this is one of the categories where we can kind of forego the fact that it's second term Cleveland, right? We could just say Grover Cleveland. Yeah. Against Bill Clinton as a person, because Cleveland was a big beer drinker, Mm -hmm. loved the night on the town, good food, good beer, bibulous night on the town. Yeah, father and a child out of wedlock. Uh, He got into that situation. Clinton, of course, though, I mean... Cleveland, obviously, marrying a 21-year-old girl while he's president. Yeah, but after that, I mean, he's... Then he settled down. Yep. I think just overall, it's got to be Clinton. You know, the stories of the... Just... There's a lengthy period of... Yeah. Yeah. He was really just getting it in Mm -hmm. left and right. Yeah, for quite a while. Yeah. Very, very long. Period. Yeah, I think this is if gonna. If not, still, who knows? Oh, well, I'm not gonna speculate on that. But I think this is gonna be a Bill Clinton hand. Yeah, he knew how to have a good time so much so that it seriously jeopardized his presidency. That's right. That's gonna bring us to the end of the game. It's time for the card count. <laughs> With the results, Stephen Lincoln Douglas had ended up with 18. Well, I had 26. And that's going to make James J. Hamilton the winner of this week's edition of Presidential War. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to keep my celebration quiet. Unlike someone in the last episode. Yeah. I'll act like I've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> well. No. Yeah. Of course, the real winner is always the audience. That's right. And that's what we and push every time we play a game of presidential war. It's all about the discussion. And it's all about learning. Mm-hmm. And we all learned a lot this episode. That's right. And we hope you'll join us again for another exciting episode of Presidential War. For the Dead Presidents Podcast, I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And I'm James A. Hamilton. Thanks for listening. <laughs>